Merci Stan. Euh, euh, je vais profiter des services de traducteurs euh, pour parler en anglais, euh, mais je voulais vous, vous signaler que je, 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 euh, il, il, me serait, euh, il me donnerait beaucoup de joie de, de, de discuter avec vous pendant les pauses ou, ou de répondre aux questions en français. Uh, uh, I want to start my uh, talk by changing my title. Uh, slightly, uh, because my hope uh, today is to get two general points across. Uh, the first point, which the original talk uh, did cover, uh, is that, as every teacher knows, what children are capable of learning at any given time depends on what they already understand. Uh, and the interdisciplinary enterprise of developmental cognitive science over the last five decades or so uh, has learned a lot that I think could be useful uh, to teachers about the origins and early development of the knowledge on which children build uh, when they go to school. Uh, but the second point, uh, which is in some tension with the first, is that although I think we've learned a lot about the underlying cognitive processes uh, that support cognitive development in infants and young children and that continue to function in us throughout life, uh, none of what we've learned, I believe, can be translated into a ready recipe uh, for how uh, uh, teachers should teach or how children are going to learn in school. Uh, what I think that uh, this work can do uh, is give us insights that can allow for a collaboration between teachers and scientists working together uh, to develop and test hypotheses uh, uh, and resolve basic questions about uh, the best ways of teaching children in any uh, uh, domain through collaborative research in classrooms. So um, I'm hoping to give you an example of that today, building on um, Esther Duflo's talk yesterday. Uh, so what is this interdisciplinary enterprise of developmental cognitive science? Well, uh, it, it's certainly not the province of any given discipline. It brings together a number of different uh, enterprises, one from psychology, both developmental, cognitive, social, uh, affective, clinical uh, psychology, uh, research into what children know at different ages, and uh, uh, the conditions under which children's knowledge grows and changes. Uh, second, uh, work uh, uh, that's conducted, I think, primarily by anthropologists and linguists, but again can involve a very interdisciplinary enterprise, public health um, uh, research as well, uh, that, that uh, focuses on development in different cultural contexts by people, uh, children living uh, in families at different economic levels, speaking different languages, with different access to different kinds of educational systems, and that asks both what's universal across uh, children's cognitive development in these different circumstances, and what varies from one place uh, uh, to another. Third, as Stan uh, uh, talked about earlier today, research in neuroscience, which is one tool, certainly not the only one, but one tool uh, for getting below the surface of what children are able to do and exhibit in behavioral experiments in the laboratory or in classrooms uh, to probe the underlying processes and ask, when do two children who give the same answer to a question do so for different reasons? When are we seeing uh, underlying uh, development of cognitive competencies and when are we just seeing behavioral changes more on the surface? And finally, uh, an enterprise that hasn't been talked about much uh, at this meeting so far, but that I think will be very useful uh, to uh, uh, the field of education going forward, uh, research into what constitutes intelligence in the abstract, what kinds of uh, computations do intelligent systems engage in? Uh, something that's uh, clearly in the news a lot, there's a big effort uh, to build more intelligent machines. I um, am not interested in that effort particularly, uh, but in the light that that effort can shed on how intelligence gets embodied in a set of computational operations in a child's uh, mind. So uh, what do we see when we take these interdisciplinary enterprises and uh, try to focus them on um, the early development of concepts that could support children's learning of school mathematics? Uh, if I can put it all in uh, one little phrase, I think it suggests that there are ways in which mathematics comes very naturally 
to human minds and other ways in which it's extremely difficult uh, and research has shed light on both of those. So let me give a few examples. Uh, starting with an experiment that was conducted in Paris in a maternity hospital with babies who were one to three days of age. Uh, Veronique Zard took stimuli like the ones that Pat Kuhl described uh, yesterday, speech syllables, but she presented them in trains so that a single utterance might consist of four repetitions of a single syllable, followed by four repetitions of a different syllable, and half the babies in the study got to hear that for about a minute, uh, and then the other half of the babies heard the same syllables, but in sequences of 12 rather than sequences of four. And after listening for a minute, the syllables continued, but a set of visual images were presented to the babies to look at. Uh, and in alternation, they saw arrays of four objects and arrays of 12 objects. And when their looking time was measured, Izar discovered that the babies looked systematically longer at the array of four objects if they were listening to sequences of four syllables, and at the array of 12 objects if they were listening to sequences of 12 syllables. So like us, they will tend to relate what they see to what they hear. Uh, and this ability to do so in this context provides evidence for sensitivity to number. Sensitivity to number that's quite abstract because it involves translating from a temporal dimension to a spatial uh, dimension from one modality uh, uh, to another, but that also is extremely imprecise when the, when the study was altered to present two numbers that differed by a smaller ratio, four syllables versus eight syllables, newborn infants failed at that task, though older infants progressively uh, uh, become sensitive uh, to sharper numerical differences. So that's example one. Here's example two for an ability that looks similar on the surface, but actually has been found to depend on a different underlying mechanism. Uh, so an, an experiment conducted by Karen Wynn some 25, almost going on 30 years ago now, um, uh, involved presenting five-month-old uh, infants with simple events in which a single object appeared at a time and was moved behind a screen. So initially, babies see one object in an array, then a screen comes up and covers it, a second object enters the uh, display from the side and is placed behind the screen, and the question to the babies is how many objects are back there. Uh, to get an answer to that question, the screen is raised, and on alternating trials, the baby sees one object versus two, uh, and they look longer when shown the wrong number of objects a pattern that's uh, characteristically seen in experiments like this, suggesting that's not what they expected. In light of encountering something unexpected, their attention is raised, uh, and uh, they're attending more, uh, likely in an effort to figure out why they uh, made the wrong uh, prediction in that case. Uh, now, this ability has been built on uh, in other laboratories to show that babies can not only add one plus one to get two, they can distinguish an array in which three objects are successively moved one at a time behind a screen and two objects are. They can compare those arrays uh, and if the objects are cookies or crackers, they will, uh, and the babies can crawl and are allowed to, they will crawl to the array that has uh, uh, more cookies. Uh, and clearly, it, it, uh, the variations show that what matters to them is the amount of cookie. They'll go for one large one over two uh, tiny ones. Now here also we see a limit but it's not a limit to the precision of the, uh, their sensitivity to number, it's a limit to numerical range. So success in these studies depends on presenting not more than three objects one at a time. When more than that is presented, baby's working memory, we believe, uh, is not able to, and, or, and attention is not able to cope with those larger numbers and uh, infants uh, fail. Uh, so those are two ways in which we can see from studies of infants uh, sensitivity to aspects of number that are available for uh, children to build on. Now another way, uh, way in which we can see what's easy in mathematics is to, to ask what people can learn in the absence of any systematic instruction. And Esther Duflo told you yesterday um, about uh, our studies of uh, market mathematicians. I'm going to save time by not repeating uh, uh, what she said yesterday, but I do want to back up and point out that 30 to 40 years worth of research now 
studying people, adults usually, sometimes children, with no formal education in mathematics, but who are farmers and have to decide how many trees can I fit within a terrain of this particular size if I need the following distances between trees? Or how much wood will I need to make this table if I'm a carpenter? Um, or how much should I be charging for the vegetables that I'm selling in a market? Uh, show that people are able to learn to use math uh, adeptly in these different circumstances. And when, when they've been studied in detail to see what kinds of operations they're using, uh, what they tend to do is verbalize out loud successive processes of addition and multiplication, not division and subtraction, not um, uh, higher mathematics, but they adeptly can use uh, addition and multiplication in order to solve uh, problems in math uh, with no formal uh, training. Now, I think uh, trying to put uh, these findings together, I think they provide evidence for uh, two core cognitive systems at the foundations of uh, mathematics um, uh, uh, that I've uh, just described, uh, two systems for uh, capturing numerical information. In addition, and, and uh, these systems are, as I said, early emerging. They capture abstract concepts, allowing uh, matching across modalities, allowing representations of objects that appear only in succession and move out of view. Um, their uh, research provides evidence that these systems are present throughout life. Uh, they're universal across cultures, and they activate specific mechanisms in the brain. You can see the activation in the same areas in an infant who's representing number, in a young child who's doing so, in an adult who's doing so with or without um, uh, education. Each of these systems is highly limited, and each of the systems is in some way predictive of children's learning in school. So in the case of the um, system for representing large numbers approximately, the precision of that system is uh, predictive of, correlated with uh, 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 children's uh, capacities for symbolic mathematics as measured either in their um, success in school math classes, the grades that they get in mathematics, or their performance on standardized uh, uh, mathematical tests. Now, number is not, core systems of number are not the whole story. Um, as we were um, hearing earlier uh, today from Torkel uh, Klingberg and others, uh, spatial cognition is extremely important uh, to uh, mathematical development uh, as well. Uh, for reasons of time, I'm not going to go into any detail uh, on that work, though I will return to it in talking about our field experiments. Uh, those are the ways in which math is easy. Here's how it's hard. First of all, we know from um, Pat Poole's work and uh, work of many other people uh, that language seems to come very naturally to children. And recent research provides evidence that as early as six months of age, about, a, about six months before babies start actually talking, saying things that other people can understand, they've already started learning the meanings of number words. If you say the word foot, while showing them a picture of a baby's foot and a picture of a glass of milk, the babies will look primarily, will tend to look more at the foot than at the milk, and vice versa if you um, uh, first say the word milk. So they're starting to learn language quite early. What's more, by the time they're two years of age, most kids living in middle-class families um, in places like France or the US have started counting objects, and in counting, they use number words. Uh, this girl, if I showed the videotape, is going through and touching each of these objects in succession and saying one, two, three, four, five, six. However, uh, if she's asked, could you give me uh, two of those frogs, uh, she look, she'll uh, look at the person as if they've asked for something nonsensical. Uh, these children, they, they start to count before they have any understanding of the meaning of these uh, uh, number words. And it'll take until the fourth year of life, somewhere around age three and a half or more, before she's likely to work out the meanings of the words that she's using in counting. Now that raises the question, why are number word meanings hard for children to learn? Is this a language problem or is it a conceptual problem? And let me turn again to Veronique Zard uh, for a study that I think sheds light on this question. Um, Azard developed a method that's actually based on studies uh, that go back to Piaget. Uh, the version I'm going to give you of it, because it's faster to describe, is a version, an adaptation of her method that was used um, 
uh, on a group of Amazonian children uh, by Julian Hara Ettinger. Uh, and he explicitly based it on Piaget's work. And it goes like this. He has a whole bag of paper cutouts of cookies. Uh, and he takes children of a wide range of uh, ages and arranges eight cookies in front of the child and eight in front of himself uh, in the same spatial arrangement and ask children, do you have more, do I have more, or do we have the same number? The children will say that uh, they have the same number. And at that point, he squishes them together into a pile and performs one of a set of different transformations on that uh, number. Uh, after performing the transformation, he then asks again, do you, have the do you have more, do I have more, or do we have uh, the same number of cookies? Now notice, no number words, no two, three, four, is being used in this uh, task. Interestingly, he finds that children find some of these transformations very easy. So if he's made the pile and he simply mixes it up a little bit without adding anything or taking anything away, kids judge that they still have the same number. If he removes half the pile, so the pile now is smaller, children judge that there's a ch been a change in number. They also judge that, that the same number is there if he takes one cookie out of the array, shows it to the child, and replaces it in the pile. They'll, they'll say that that's the same number. The transformations they have trouble with are these. Suppose he removes just one and then asks the question. Or without removing anything, he adds one and then asks the question. Or the transformation that I think is the most interesting, very similar to the one where a single one was removed and replaced, but now he takes one out, reaches into the bag, and brings back a different one that looks just like the first one. Now the children seem radically unsure what the right answer should uh, be. It seems as if there's a conceptual problem here. There's something about exact cardinal values and exact equality uh, that these children aren't uh, getting. Uh, now, interestingly, in the Amazon, the number of words that they learn, uh, they learn in Spanish. And they start to learn them when they go to school. And different children start school at different ages. So with controls for age, you can see that success on these conceptual tasks is predictable from the children's uh, learning the meanings of um, the number of words uh, in that language. So that's one way, I think, in which math is hard. Another way in which math is hard that, again, I'm going to pass over because Esther Duflo talked about it uh, yesterday, comes from studies of, and in fact, many of the talks yesterday were about the problems that so many children in the developing world have in mastering the basic mathematics uh, uh, curriculum. The children that we studied uh, uh, were seventh graders matched to the group of market math children um, that Esther talked about uh, yesterday. Uh, and we found uh, that although most of those children could succeed at grade two subtraction problems once they got to seventh grade, and more than half of them could succeed at grade four problems. If you looked at how they were succeeding, it looks like they have not mastered math in a way that could really be useful to them in their daily lives, okay? They, they required paper to answer the questions. If they were given a simple question like, um, bananas cost 20 rupees each, uh, you wanna buy eight, uh, eight bananas, how much is that gonna cost you? They would laboriously add successive twos to get to four, and then instead of adding four or multiplying four by four or adding successive fours, they would resort to creating a whole table that they had learned by rote of counting by fours and then uh, count up to get the right answer. So even when they're getting the answer right, uh, it's through an extremely laborious process. And in, ex in, in the most extreme cases, there were children who resorted to tallying uh, to um, answer these questions, get the right answer. So questions raised by this work, why is math learning so easy in some cases? Why does it be, how is it able to begin so easily and then become so hard uh, for so many children when they get to school? Uh, second, how do children develop the concepts and skills that school math teaches? When children learn these uh, skills successfully, what are they doing? How does that happen? And three, most importantly, I think, how can school math learning be enhanced, especially for poor children at high risk of failure? Now, what I want to do is now shift the talk and suggest that these questions are connected and that they can be addressed through a collaborative partnership between researchers in developmental cognitive science on the one hand and teachers on the other uh, who are there 
uh, and are the prime movers of children's conceptual development in the environments that we who work in laboratories can't get to, uh, uh, the situations in which children actually learn the, the um, noisy and rich social environment of a school. Um, so what do we learn from cognitive science research uh, about how children learn in the laboratory that might be helpful uh, for uh, research aimed to enhance their learning in school? Uh, well, one thing that we learn is that most number words are taught in the context of small sets of objects. But when you present children, young children, with a small set of objects, in general, uh, they're going to be predisposed to represent those objects as individuals, not as um, members of a set. Uh, and in fact, research in the laboratory shows that the more children attend to individual objects, the less likely they are to represent um, a set's cardinal value. Now this problem only gets worse uh, if children are encouraged to count because counting directly has the child saying words like two and three that refer to a set while pointing to an individual object, making it all the harder to see what those words are actually uh, referring to. In contrast, when children engage in ordinary informal conversation with other people, they hear lots of things and start to say lots of things that could be informative about the logical properties uh, of um, the system of natural numbers. For example, if they hear an expression like uh, some cats or three cats, uh, the, uh, the determiner, the quantifier in, in that simple noun phrase, some or three, uh, can immediately alert the child to the fact that you're not simply designating uh, one object when you say, you know, look at the, look, there's some cats over there, uh, that there's some set that you're uh, referring to, while the noun divides its reference. So the noun cat is picking out each of those cats as an individual, while some or three is picking them out um, as a group. What's more, children aren't only hearing noun phrases, they're hearing some sentences, and sentences can be really informative. Without looking at anything in the world, a child could in principle learn that three means three when they hear sentences like, these are my, cat these are my three cats, Blackie, Rusty, Tiger, three different individuals being named um, uh, in that sentence. So this suggests that Ordinary, the kind of ordinary language expressions that children can encounter when they communicate with other people in a context that involves thinking about number uh, could allow children to overcome some of the limits on attention um, and uh, clarify uh, the meaning, the, uh, the nature of the system of concepts that these number words are uh, expressing. Moving on, how do children go from that to learning arithmetic? How do they develop a, a, a sense of the logic behind the arithmetic algorithms that are being taught in school? Well, that logic depends on a kind of representation that may be hard for children who are now in school for the same reason that the representation three cats could be hard for a preschool child. Namely, a representation that a set of 10 dots enclosed within a circle uh, can be equivalently described um, as uh, uh, ten, uh, uh, 10 distinct individual units or one unit of magnitude 10, right? That those are two different uh, logically equivalent descriptions. Uh, and the algorithms of arithmetic require that you move nimbly between one of these descriptions and uh, the other. Now, beautiful research uh, by Kelly Mix has shown that this is hard for kids uh, in kindergarten uh, and at the beginning of school. She presented arrays like this to children and simply asked them how many objects are in the array. Uh, and she found that the dominant responses were either to count each individual, to, to assume that object meant dot, and to count each individual dot one by one, um, or to assume that object meant circle and to count uh, one, two, three. Now, in this context, encouraging the children to count by tens actually didn't help. She said, no, no, wait, you know, I want you to count um, the, uh, there's 10 dots in each of these circles. Count me the number of tens you have. So the kids would go 10, 20, 30, full stop. And then she'd say, no, no, what about those two dots over there? So they'd go, oh, okay, fine, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, right? They'd learned the succession of uh, words and hadn't worked out how to decompose uh, tens into ones, how to compose from ones a set of 10, um, uh, and so forth. Now, again, I think in ordinary conversations, um, in which children encounter objects that are grouped uh, into groups, uh, natural language can be much more 
helpful. There's all kinds of things that people can say in that context that can point children uh, through their language to this dual representation of one set of, uh, of 10 or uh, multiple sets of uh, 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 numbers uh, grouped in, into tens. And uh, uh, again, sentences can actually pick out the exact meanings of those uh, large number words and the ways in which they're composed in, in the base 10 system. So I think in both of these cases, language and spatial symbols can help to reveal the compositional structure of natural number um, uh, and make sense of the uh, algorithms of arithmetic. And I'm probably running low on time, so I'm going to go over all of the evidence from past research. Uh, it's here. I'll, I'll, I'll talk over it uh, and just say that there's a lot of evidence that children's um, uh, six, uh, successful learning of mathematics can be predicted by the size of their vocabulary in general, the number of number words in their vocabulary in particular, um, that uh, uh, interventions that encourage uh, kids and the uh, adults in their families to talk about number uh, can positively impact on um, uh, children's uh, school readiness, uh, and games that spontaneous, especially concrete games played with concrete materials in a social context between a group of children or with a between a group of children and an adult, um, uh, fostering language and, uh, and communication uh, uh, is, is at least positively associated uh, with better outcomes for children when they get to school and start learning math. So that then generates for us um, uh, a hypothesis. The hypothesis is that if we go to a place like India, uh, where the children who are in school now are in most cases the first generation of children to go to school. It's just in this generation in recent uh, decades uh, that school has really become universal across um, populations in poor countries, uh, countries with large um, populations of, of, uh, of poor children, so their parents are not educated. Uh, but for those people, uh, those children, they may benefit from games. Am I out of time already? Okay, I'm, okay, let me move on. They may benefit from games that, um, uh, 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 <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that um, uh, allow one to recreate in preschool classrooms the kind of environments that more privileged children would have at, at home. So um, Esther Duflo talked about our first experiment to test this. I'm not going to um, repeat it. Let me just show you um, a picture of uh, some of the games that we used. As I said, they all involve concrete materials. Each game was designed to exercise uh, a different core system of mathematics, so they're all based on research on infants. Our thinking was that an infant has to be able to grow up uh, to become a competent member of any society, so if we find abilities in infants, they should be universal and applicable uh, uh, everywhere. Um, so they were introduced into classrooms for four months. At the end of that time, uh, as Esther showed you yesterday, we saw, first of all, that children took to the games and that they robustly improved the acuity of their numerical representations, their sensitivity to geometry. And although the games disappeared after four months, a full year later, those gains were still there. If you look at the difference between the children who got our math games and the children who got a matched set of games with no math content, that difference is as large a year later as it was when we first arrived. However, when we look at the benefit on symbolic uh, number learning, we find a benefit on learning the symbols that were present in the preschool, but no benefit a year later on learning the symbols when children got to school. This is why I believe we need research. We can't simply go from theoretical considerations that arise from findings obtained in labs to prescriptions to what was going to work in school. Uh, here's a failed prediction uh, from uh, uh, such an experiment. Uh, but it led us to ask uh, to capitalize on the strengths of the first uh, intervention and to create a new set of games. Uh, oops, it looks like they didn't show up. Sorry. OK. A new set of games which followed the same procedures but uh, used symbols in addition to non-symbolic materials. So did any of these come through? Uh, uh, no, sorry. They, um, uh, they, in addition to having arrays of dots, there were also Arabic uh, cards with Arabic numbers on them, and children moved interchangeably from the first set to the second set. And now, uh, uh, when we turn to symbolic measures, we see not only a benefit uh, at the end of preschool, but also a benefit at the end of the uh, first school year. 
But the benefit was small, and I think it's because we weren't training the base 10 system. So we're in the middle now of a third intervention uh, where we again give, here's an example of our, our cards that mix uh, symbolic with non-symbolic materials, uh, and now choosing non-symbolic materials that we hope will elicit conversation uh, that emphasizes the base 10 structure of the number system. Now, in this case, the research is um, uh, still in progress. We don't have any findings yet. We do know from our process monitoring that both teachers, who, by the way, collaborated with us in uh, developing these materials, both teachers and students like the games and are playing them effectively. Remains to be seen, of course, whether this will have an impact um, on their um, education in, in formal mathematics. But uh, let me uh, close with my last slide, uh, uh, which is an invitation uh, to all of the teachers in this room to join us in what I think could be a really exciting enterprise uh, and an important approach to addressing crucial questions uh, about how uh, to uh, better and more effectively educate uh, our children. Uh, it's an enterprise that draws on research in cognitive science when it's useful, uh, when it's uh, pertinent, but that doesn't attempt to simply apply it across the board to classrooms. Instead, it uses it as a source of hypotheses that can be developed into experiments that make sense to teachers, that look to teachers as if they have uh, a, um, a strong chance of working, of being effective for the children, working for the children, and working uh, uh, for them, and that can be evaluated uh, through uh, randomized controlled uh, experiments uh, in classrooms. Now, one nice thing about basing such interventions on research on early cognitive development is that if they end up working anywhere, then it's worth considering that they might work everywhere because they're building on processes that are universal in young children and that continue to exist in us uh, 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 as adults. And so I think, we, we heard it, uh, a whole uh, session earlier today on going beyond the reading wars. I think one of the things that carried us beyond the reading wars was that instead of opposing one ideological position to another, people have actually gone out and done research and figure out, to figure out what works. And not surprisingly, at the end of the day when you do that, you find that there was truth on both sides and a path forward to curricula that will be better than anything one imagined originally. Uh, I hope we can do that uh, in the case of other domains of education. Um, turn uh, teachers into teacher scientists and scientists into scientist uh, teachers uh, and work to address some of the hardest questions that face us in this time of rapid technological change. What should we be teaching? When should we be teaching it? How should we be teaching it? I don't know the answers to any of these questions, but I think we have tools at hand with which to address them. Thank you. <laughs>